Broadcasting from the campus of Salisbury University, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7. Putting Delmarva first. It's time for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. It was called Georgetown, not the one in Delaware, but an African-American community quite near downtown Salisbury. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. By one account, Georgetown was uptown, West Main Street was downtown, and there was even a Humphreys Lake. The community ultimately disappeared with the arrival of Routes 13 and 50 that cut through the heart of the city. Linda Dwyer has authored a book filled with pictures and maps of what once was this thriving African-American community. It's called Around the Pond, and she joins us in the studio this morning. Thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you for having me. Well, let's let's start with where this is, right? Because I, 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 when I, I was not aware that there was such a community and, or that, that there was a lake as well. How did, how did you wind up, first of all, getting an intrigue or finding out about this? Well, I grew up in Salisbury from the age of two, and um, still, I'm afraid to admit this, I... Growing up, I really didn't absor- absorb Salisbury's history. I didn't know much about Salisbury's history, I was, uh, so let alone its African American history. And I had moved away uh, for college and work in the suburb, Maryland suburbs of Washington D.C., and then um, des- decided to come back and learn more. Um, but I had heard that an old black church was being uh, renovated uh, for use as a cultural center which became the um, Charles H. Chipman Cultural Center in Salisbury. And so I thought that, was, you know, I, I had barely remembered the church when I was growing up, boarded up. I might have seen it even just once or noticed it once. Uh, so I got curious about what they were renovating. I started attending their meetings and um, uh, learned from a woman, uh, Elaine Brown, who was sort of their unofficial historian and retired school teacher um, from the segregated Salisbury High School uh, that it was called in Georgetown. And uh, so where's the church? There had to have been a community, and I wanted to uh, document that community. I knew nothing about it. It looked, you got two highways going through it. There are very few landmarks left. Um, that building is pro- the, the only public landmark left, although there are a few other buildings. Uh, so I just started asking her. I said, uh, "Miss Brown, could you uh, teach me or tell me more about the history of this neighborhood?" And nowhere was it mentioned as being Georgetown, the name Georgetown. Just a few people have been telling me that. And so I decided, well, it's not documented anywhere. So I kept collecting information. Mm-hmm. She invited me to her home, and she strong armed. She invited several <laughs> her of her. Um, uh, older friends, uh, many of whom had lived in that area, to come, and we had these discussion meetings where she, we talked about. They told me what it was like right. living where it was, what it was like living um, in that community, and what it was like. Um, so, if you look, know where the Chipman Cultural Center is, that was pretty the cent- pretty much the center of the whole area. You know, at one point um, there had been Humphreys Lake in Salisbury um, up until 1909 right and it was drained uh, when the when the dam broke and they decided not to put it back because they gave them extra property and so part of that property became part part of um, Georgetown as well but that little community is one of the oldest in Salisbury it's associated with Poplar Hill Mansion and so I decided to you know research it to, to learn as much as I could about it so let me ask you this. So if we just start with with uh, the the Charles uh, uh, Chipman uh, Cultural Center, mm-hmm. as you look as you look south, okay, towards uh, towards downtown, mm-hmm. before 1909, before mm-hmm. the before the lake uh, was was uh, cleaned up, what did the town ta- what what did that part look like, and what were we what were we looking at in terms of Georgetown? Well, and, if and you were at Africa. the church and you were on its front steps and you were looking s- south, you would have seen Church Street go through. No, no Route 50. It's going through about where Route 50 is. And then beyond that, maybe another street or two. And then beyond that, um, the lake, which is about where the 
the um, parking lot is and, and where um, Main Street is in that location. Main Street didn't go through that area. So actually, uh, Don, the John Wesley Church was referred to as the Church on the Hill. So it's up a little bit on the bluff, and then it slopes down towards the bottom land of the lake. And one thing you had mentioned was when I asked uh, these people, I said, well, what were the black communities in Salisbury? And one friend of mine, <laughs> Gladys Stewart, said we had uptown, downtown, and around the pond. I said, uptown, uptown. Um, she said was Georgetown. Downtown was uh, West Main Street area, the west side of Salisbury, sort of the black business district and their residential area. And I said, well, what's around the pond? What really is there is really two little neighborhoods right next to each other in Georgetown. Uh, I, it's always collectively referred to as Georgetown. There's no boundary between the two, but really the more bottom land along the, the lake area was really an area called Cuba or QB. And some people would think, well, that's a little unsavory area, you know, but yet they were right next to each other. You know, Cuba was, I mean, the Georgetown area was, was different, and yet they were so close and right next to each other. Um, what surprised me was that there was a, a black community right in the downtown Salisbury, you know. I had grown up, I'm a baby boomer. I grew up um, noticing Salisbury during my youth as being geographically segregated, uh, with the west side being predominantly the African-American area and the rest being predominantly white. Um, You can see that today as the vestige of our um, election districts uh, with two, uh, one and two. Um, so it was a surprise to me that uh, there had been a neighborhood right downtown wedged in between Newtown and the downtown business district and the railroad tracks and um, before the, the highways went through. So it was a major surprise to me. And and, and so often I, I majored in geography and also the interest in African-American history. And I had always thought of historically communities – with their black section, the African-American section, as being nearby but somehow divided by a railroad track or a river or something. And that was true. I know a a teacher here, she referred to them as satellite communities, you know. But in fact, you know, Georgetown was right downtown. Um, Whites and blacks lived across the street from each other. So what what was the origin of this uh, of this of this community as we sort of reach back as the Poplar Mansion? I think, I think it was yeah. um, uh, Pop- Poplar Hill Mansion right. because much of the, part of that area, uh, most of the area, was on property that had once belonged to Poplar Hill Mansion. Uh, in fact, um, see the John Wesley Church was founded by five freedmen. Most or all of them had been enslaved. They were freed at the time in 1830s, 37, and 38. Um, and uh, some of the housing had might have been either freedmen's housing or um, slave housing. So that connection was close to Poplar Hill man- Mansion. And, of course, it grew a little bit. You know, Of course, the area of the neighborhood was small, but so was Salisbury. So. Right. So, so, so then, so as we expand out from there, um, so, so is this the, the community that sort of then develops out of this, out of this um, plantation, for lack of a better word, this 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 mansion area? I mean, is that how that works? Cause, well, cause they I, were. Yeah, because I know there were. I, I think there's. A, I think you mentioned that uh, in your book that there were some folks who look as if they had been, say, freed slaves, who then got became involved with the John Wesley uh, mm-hmm. Church. Correct. Yes, they ha- they had and. Um, and I imagine they're more so ha- worked that way. Where we can, some may have been uh, freed, uh, freedmen uh, all along. I mm-hmm. don't really know. Uh, I just knew that the five founders of the John Wesley Church, some of them had been enslaved at one point or another. One bought their freedom and bought the freedom of his wife um, and their children went on to be kind of prominent in the community, uh, that sort of thing. Um, in fact, I was just rereading my book earlier, mm-hmm. and uh, there was a quote that one of the members of the community, Solomon Houston, 
his father, I, we believe, had been Levin Houston, who had been enslaved and was freed and then was one of the members of the founders of the John Wesley Church. Solomon Houston, Houston was quoted as having been the richest African-American in this part of the state. And he and, you know, so there were a lot of surprises in my research. And he was related, you know. Um, so you can see on the old 1877 atlas, the, the the pond, the lake, Humphreys Lake, and you can see some indication of um, uh, African Americans living along it, not far from Poplar Hill Mansion. And Poplar Hill Row Avenue uh, was the access drive for Poplar Hill. So, so what was this community like at the time? Was it developed and into the into the say into the turn of the twenty and into the twentieth century? What what kinds of businesses? What kind of people were involved? Did you get a sense at all about that? Yes, I did, and I know that I had I had mentioned to you that uh, Richard Cooper had written the book a book on. Uh, he's written several books. He's sur- was a surveyor and you know, Salisbury historian and had written a lot of books. And he's the only one that actually, up until me, had um, mentioned Georgetown or the area Cuba and Georgetown at all. And uh, it was with a negative connotation as being a slum. <laughs> and uh, and so I kind of challenged him a bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he was very gracious and offered a lot of information to me, uh, which actually countered a lot of what he said. Uh, yes, there were rental properties, um, but it wasn't a slum, or at least the whole thing was not a slum. And I, I often ask audiences, what do you call a place that had not one, not two, but three churches, and expanded to three churches, an elementary school that was two stories, a high school, a small high school, a Masonic hall, a grocery store, a bicycle shop, a barber shop, Masonic hall, I think I said, and um uh, Dry good, at least two dry goods stores, a funeral business. Uh, they had, sure, they had laborers, but they had uh, porters, uh, seamstresses, people that owned their own businesses, building houses, um, bricklayers, haulers, anything that was needed in Salisbury. There were many uh, African Americans that owned their own businesses, but they were in a in a location where they could work either downtown as porters or cooks or whatever, or they could work in the service of re- the residents of, like, new, the Newtown area. And um, so this was an area that had, you know, like I, two, two uh, cemeteries, two schools. Um, so this was the place where people were born. They were raised. They worshipped. They were educated in two schools. Uh, they they married, they worked, they served their community in, or, in fraternal organizations. They lived, they died, and were buried in Salisbury, right in that neighborhood. So I always say to people, well, what kind of term do you use to describe a, little, a small neighborhood or a community like that? And I say neighborhood. It's, you know, it was, it was more than, than – and I, I was – Wanted, I never wanted to write a book initially. I was just researching. Um, but these, there were two reasons that made me put, do a book. One was that uh, the people that I interviewed kept imploring, imploring me to make sure that uh, the history of Georgetown wasn't forgotten. And it took me a long time to write, publish the book. And many of them had passed by that time. Um, but also in the meantime, Mr. Cooper had written his book and was saying these things, these brief things about Georgetown. And I, I knew that I didn't want that to be the definitive history of Georgetown. I know it needed to be uh, in the libraries and available for um, uh, people who are researching and, and to be proud of their neighborhood. There is no sign. There is no historical Marker, marker for um, Georgetown. There is one for the building of the John Wesley Church that is now the Chipman Cultural Center, but there's no sign that explains there's a whole neighborhood around here, and there are remnants to it. So, sorry if I went on too much. But. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> so, so tell me then also a little bit about the, this this lake, or I guess as I was looking at the book, it's like Humphreys Pond, and there's Humphreys Lake, 
and and describe for me how these these rivers and and, and intersected. Why is it they decided that once the, brand, the well, dam broke, it they just didn't? There's two yeah. prong, two prongs to the Wicomico River, and Sol, most of Salisbury, the old Salisbury is dead. Right downtown is between the two, and they form um, the Wicomico River. They both have lakes on them. The north prong still does, um, but the uh, east prong had a Humphreys Lake, and when it drained, that when the, the big storm and the dam burst, um, some entrepreneurs, and I can't pronounce that very well, decided, hmm, <laughs> there was some property to be had, and then I, so they decided not to um, put the la- lake back in, and they created a realty company for all those properties. That includes the area around um, the park now, you know, you go through the park and you see some low areas in the park, uh, not far from the zoo. There was a lake there, and that's why it's low. You know, if you could, if you drive around the park, that's that's where the lake was. That's where the lake was. Okay, it's harder to imagine that downtown because uh, East Main Street ended at Division. And there was a big house there too, right where next to the courthouse. Um, but and beyond that house was the lake. So they extended Route uh, Main Street, and they graded a lot over the years. So, it, but you can tell when you're at Divi- uh, Division and Main Street, and you drive down towards Route 13, you can, you're going downhill a little bit. Now, one, there's a number of prominent people that, that come out of this, but one of the ones mm-hmm. that, that jumped out at me was Sergeant William Butler, yes. who's the hero of Water Street, is, is how you call <laughs> Tell me then a little bit about him, because uh, this was during the First World War. Uh, yes. And, uh, and uh, it's, I guess, most much of what we know is from the Scots official history of the uh, African-American Negro and world, in the World War. T- tell me a little bit about him, and what do we know about him, and how did he... Well, all I mostly what yeah. I knew was uh, from the book you re- referenced. Uh, I forget how I came up with the name in the first place, <laughs> um, but I did find that book, and um, that you talked about. But also, Stephen Genrich from Salisbury University has a big interest in the history of uh, World War One, and, and in particular African American involvement. So I had been in touch with him. Uh, before and after the, the printing of the book, and he explained the 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 book as well as the book, the 369th, I think it was his heroism in World War One. He did return uh, to Salisbury briefly, and he was honored in um, the John Wesley Church. Gave a big program honoring him. Gave him a gold watch, according to newspaper articles. <laughs> um, but and he had married a woman and was living on Water Street, right where the uh, the parking lots are now. And But for some reason, he left the area and divorced. And uh, Stephen found out that he ended up in Washington, Washington, D.C., had a business and for many years. And um, But he, he died, I think, in the 1950s and is buried in Arlington Cemetery. Uh, he committed suicide. Hmm. Not clear why he was ill, but he also had lost his business. But you also wonder what effect World War One had on him because it was a very negative. People often talk about uh, African American um, veterans coming back after World War Two and the abuses they felt they they experienced, but it was even worse for World War One. Um, veterans and uh, but he was so decorated in New York City and along with the group got a ticker tape parade <laughs> so I was rather surprised to find him having been uh, from Salisbury because so. he, you mentioned I guess uh, uh, that uh, he was actually hit fired on some Germans and uh, was able to actually get some Americans who've been captured uh, exactly released. exactly yes he, he did fire uh, his tr- his group was being fired upon. I think several died or something, and he was being fired on. But he, I don't know how he managed to do it, but he did end up firing on the Germans and actually capturing some and bringing bringing them back. So, um, 
few people know that he was. We had a hero here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so tell me then, uh, by the way, a little bit about uh, Charles Chipman because he's because he is his he really plays a sort of his prominent role. Mm-hmm. Some people have been some people uh, later on in his life were very critical of him and mm-hmm. and kind of what kind of role did he play in this community? Well, he was uh, not from Salisbury. He was from New Jersey. He almost went when he when he got his degrees. He almost went to Tuskegee. Uh, to teach, but he got an offer here to not only teach but be a principal of of the of the black high school um and he married someone who was from this area um Jeanette Pinkett she too was related to uh, the five one of the five that that founded the john wesley church um but you have to realize that uh in the nineteen forties route Route 13 went through the community. It took the AME church, and it might have taken the elementary school. Then Route 50 went through and took the Baptist church and so many other businesses. Um, the How the John Wesley building survived might be part ge- um, geography and, and part to, due to the um, the will of uh, the Chipmans because uh, there was no community left. All the members were joining a church on the we- the White uh, Chapel on the uh, west side. So it ceased being a church and he bought the building to save it with his goal in mind of one day being a cultural center and which it did. And so that was his role in um, saving that building. Uh, I don't know what you mean in terms of other roles. I mean, he, yeah, I, I, I don't know how. He, yeah, I guess he was prominent in the community. And, yeah, he was very prominent in the community. I don't know how he was. Yeah. How there was controversy. Mm. I may have heard some along the way. Sure. But any time when there's a, you know, a transfer of a building, there's sometimes controversy. Sure. But you have to hand. Actually, it was probably his wife's role. Mostly, she was probably the one that pushed the hardest. I was told this. Um, for to make to make sure that this was a cultural center, so they were a team, and she was from here, so that's pretty good. So now, uh, also before we leave this, um, there I guess there are two cemeteries. One's Houston, and the other one is Potter's Field. Tell me about those. Well, they're on the other side of the railroad tracks, nice. and there's one so one cemetery that's long been known as Salisbury Cemetery. Um, it was sort of cut through by the Route 50. And it's right, you can see it on the side of the, the highway behind, next to the Arby's, you know, and you go under the, come up from under the uh, railroad tracks. And that's a very old cemetery that had been segregated with a colored section. And you can see that on the 1877 Atlas. And um, I think Levin Houston is buried there. And uh, not many markers. But there's a there's a cemetery right behind it. Uh, the property was purchased, I think, 1901, so it's nowhere near as old as the uh, old Salisbury City Cemetery, and that was purchased by uh, um, Solomon Houston and uh, U.G. Langston and a number of families as a multi-family cemetery for African Americans that they could control, and it was named the Houston Cemetery. And um, some people confuse. They think they're both the same hmm. cemetery, but they're not. So, so. Uh, but by the way, tell me uh, the, the person you were talking about, uh, Elaine Brown. Tell me a little bit about her, because she seemed to be instrumental in, in really for well, she, in the, in she the was very world. involved in the Chipman Foundation and the restoration plans for um, uh, the building. She that had belonged to that church. Um, until it moved to, to another the west side and she continued continued with wesley temple she always had an interest in the history she was a re- retired school teacher english she like, taught drama and everything um and she had family you know that had lived in the georgetown area and that sort of thing she was really nice uh when I asked, I wanted to learn more about this. She was very open. I was virtually a st- stranger, <laughs> you know, so that was very kind of her to bring me into her home and invite all her friends um, to talk openly to me. 
Uh, I didn't. Obviously, I could not speak to everyone I could possibly speak to. Um, but thanks to her, I, I, I met so many people. Uh, she died shortly before the um, grand opening of the Chipman Cultural Center. Um, but, but she was thrilled. She knew we had made the money. <laughs> Well, because I think, as a matter of fact, I think it was an account where uh, she talks about, I guess it was a, a state superintendent coming in, and just the quote is this. So he looked at me and said right in front of the children after he'd been there for a while and listening to what I was saying, he said, you don't look like you're scared of me at all. I just <laughs> looked at him and smiled and kept right on until after I was finished and dismissed my class. Yes, I had forgotten that was in there. But Sounds she was, like a very strong She uh, was a built- strong uh, Strong-willed person that didn't always come across well, but she was, um, uh, but she was determined to get to have you know her her way and the right thing. Yeah, she was a pretty strong-willed person. I have to admit that. And she was talkative. I when we had these meetings, group discussion meetings in her home, she wanted to talk so bad, and yet mm. she she stayed out of the room on purpose so that I could learn from all these people. She was strong-willed, but she was very generous. Very generous. So the one incident occurs uh, in 1931. There was a, a hanging, mm-hmm. a lynching in Salisbury. And um, you had not actually asked anybody about this during your during your discussions, except for one particular Except for one man. man. And, um, tell, me, tell me about that, because it seemed, because as we were talking before we, uh, we were on the air, that this this moment seems so really dramatic to you in terms of, in terms of who he was. And, and, and it, I back. believe it was pivotal to the demise of, Georgetown. Um, many may not agree with me, <laughs> but um, I believe so. When I grew up, I had, I had heard about the lynching of Matthew Williams, but I never heard of Georgetown. <laughs> so I just assumed uh, African Americans who may have been trying to to run run home to the safety of their homes were all going home to the West Side. That wasn't, you know, so. But once I was at these meetings and learning all about Georgetown, and I knew that this man, Howard per- Purnell, had been a young adult at the time of the lynching, I could could not resist asking him. Uh, I didn't did not bring up the topic in our meetings because I just had come to know these people. I figured it wasn't my place. If they wanted to bring it up to any of the negative stuff, I'd be happy to talk about it and listen. Um, but I didn't bring it up. But at the end of one of our meetings, when everybody was gone, he he uh, he and another man, James Jolly, got up, headed for the door, and I'm sitting there, and he and I said, Mr. Mr. Purnell, where were you on December 4th, 1931? And he stopped in his tracks, and he looked at me, and he said, What do you mean, the lynching? And I said, Yes, I think I said that. And he said, and he looked at me, and he, I think he must have been shocked by the question, maybe that the timing of the question and he said yes he says i was there and what really sticks in my crawl that was my mother's birthday so he sat down and he began to tell me about having witnessed the lynching a lynching of a fellow classmate you know he had been in uh he he worked at the uh Wicomico hotel which was right across the street uh from the lynching at the courthouse uh, that he usually works nights, but he he switched his hours to work go to a movie right on Main Street, and while he was in the movie theater, word was circulating what was happening outside, and everyone was leaving, and I just was imagining everyone going to the west, running to go home to the west side. But no, he lived in Georgetown. His way to go home would be to walk past the courthouse, down Main Street, past the courthouse past Wicomico Hotel, down Main Street, all the way to where the railroad tracks were, turn left and go into this. He was living with his parents at the time. Uh, he would have had to go right into the mob. As it was, he had to go towards the mob to ma- to Division Street. Instead, he made a quick left. He heard, he heard you know, his classmate being um, strung up several times, and he rushed down uh, Church Street to get home. Uh, when he got to his parents home his father was upstairs at the window with a shotgun to watch what's going on because you never knew during a lynching what might happen to the other people and he could witness the body being burned because it was the body was dragged from um, the courthouse down main street to right in front of the georgetown uh, cuba neighborhood 
uh, for that purpose of showing them the burning of the body. And um, and he was burned right where the parking lot is now, where the where the flea market happens every day, every every weekend. And um, so it was definitely a terrorizing situation for that community of Georgetown. It was terrorizing for everybody. And it was terrorizing afterwards because Georgetown was so interlocked with downtown. Whites and blacks crossed each other in the street to go to church, go to business every day. And those people had to go into the homes in Newtown to work for those white families and look each other in the eye. So it was a very tense time after that, particularly for Georgetown. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happened in 31, so in 1940s, Route 13 cut through and took part of it, and then Route 50 took through, went through. Now, and one of the things about the about talking about Purnell is that that he, I mean, the words sort of it seemed came to pour out, out of him. him. It poured out of him like he couldn't control. It's a, it's as if I'd bumped into him, and then the, the words were started to fall out, and he couldn't stop it. He sat down. On, on the sofa next to me, Mr. Jolly in the chair opposite, and he just, he just, words just poured out of what had happened. And um, at one time, we all just stopped with our mouths agape. <laughs> you know, I couldn't believe what he had just said, you know, and he couldn't believe what he had just said. Because I don't think he was used to talking about it, certainly not to someone white and a, virtually a stranger. And suddenly he heard something. I had a tape recorder between us that I had uh, had been running for our meeting earlier and I just forgot about it and it was still running and he heard the whir of the other tape recorder and the frightened look on his face I'll never forget because it was such a raw frightened look as if the lynching had occurred the day before so that impact of what, what that happened has impacted him all these years uh, after I did that interview, um, I didn't ask many more questions. I was so grateful that he he bothered to talk to me about it. Later on, Sherilyn Eiffel did a book on on the courthouse lawn, uh, on all the, this this lynching and other lynchings, and she had interviewed him and she, he refused to talk. He wouldn't talk about it. In fact, she said he took it to her, his grave. I wrote her. I said that's not true. He told me, <laughs> but. He, that just shows you the power of what a lynching can do all those years later. So what do you make of the fact that we, for the most part in Salisbury, really don't know anything about this community? It's almost disappeared from from our memories. Um, I mean, obviously there were people who have been here a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but also we have lots of people who are coming in who've never been here before and washing away some of that, that history that, that mm -hmm. you... Some people growing up didn't yeah. know African Americans growing up. I had learned did not know uh, about the history. It's hard to make something of that. I don't know if there were such bad feelings that, of having really your neighborhood taken away from you and the moving to the west side. <laughs> there might have been some bitterness, and that always brings a feeling of families just not wanting to talk about things. Now, I don't know if that's part of it. I don't um, don't know why. Um, certainly not in any history books. Oddly, the lynching is. Right, of course that is. That's in the history books, but not the neighborhood itself. And it kind of perplexes me, too. Um, there really should be a memorial to, to it, as well as books. We've been speaking with uh, Linda Dwyer. She has authored a book called Round the Pond. It's a book that's filled with pictures and maps of the once thriving African-American community, Georgetown, which is not Georgetown as in Delaware, but Georgetown here actually in Salisbury. And that's uh, something that uh, a rich history. And I appreciate you taking time to stop by Thank and you. talk with us. Thank you very much. This has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. And thanks for listening. This has been Del Marva Today, a production of Del Marva Public Radio. Chris Rank produces and is our audio engineer. Don Rush is your host. For podcasts, visit our website, delmarvapublicradio.net, or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast in iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on Pack 14 
To view the schedule, visit the Daily Times or visit pac14.org.